Truth Tables, Part 4, The Short Method of Testing for Validity. In Truth Tables Part 3, you saw how to test arguments for validity using truth tables. For example, this argument, with two variables, is easy to test for validity by constructing a full table. Unfortunately, as arguments get increasingly complex, the truth tables get exponentially longer. A full truth table for this argument with six variables requires 64 rows. Thankfully, there's a way to abbreviate the process. Recall that in order to test for validity, all we need to find is one row where all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. So in our first example, we could ignore the first two rows altogether. Their conclusions are true, so we're not interested in rows with true conclusions, we're interested in rows where all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. So we can blank those out. Now this means that we can just start with the rows that are false. And since we know that there's at least one row where the conclusion is false, and any argument that doesn't have a tautology as a conclusion, we can simply construct one of those rows. So we stipulate that P is false. Then we look to see if, given that the conclusion is false, is there any way that all the premises can be true? Now notice that the P that's found in the first premise, the conjunction if P then Q, we've also made it false. That's because if the conclusion P is false, P is false no matter where we find it in that possible world, or in our case, in whatever row we find it. So if P is false in the conclusion, it's false wherever it lands in the premises as well. Now, when stipulating that the conclusion is false, it's hard to go wrong. Remember that a truth table represents all possible combinations of truth values. So as long as you construct a possible row or a possible world, you've constructed at least one row of the table. Now we ask, can we make the premises in this argument true? It turns out, yes. Now we can just make Q true, and we've found a combination of values, a possible world. There's nothing inconsistent here. We've constructed a row that we would have found if we'd constructed the full table, where all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Therefore, this argument is invalid. Now what about our long argument? The process is exactly the same. We start by stipulating or forcing the conclusion to be false. We know that that's true in at least one possible world. And then we distribute those truth values throughout the argument. So in order for R or W to be false, since it's a disjunction, we know that both disjuncts have to be false. So R is false and W is false in order to make R or W false. And then we distribute those truth values back into the premises. Where, wherever we find R, we make R false. Where, wherever we find W, we make W false. Now we ask whether we can make all the premises true. And it turns out we can. The premises are disjunctions. And the only false disjunction is one where both disjuncts are false, just like we saw in our conclusion. So as long as we make S and B true, it doesn't matter what we make P and Q we will have a line where all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. So this argument, too, is invalid. Here's another example using the short method on a long argument. Here we have a conclusion that's not S. So it's a complex claim. It's not a simple claim. It does have an operator. The operator is the negation. To see whether this argument is valid, we stipulate that not S is false, and then try to make all the premises true. Same method we've been using. Now to make not S false, we have to make S true. And whatever truth value S has in the conclusion, it has that truth value anywhere else it's found in the argument. In this case, in premise 1. Now the question is whether we can make all the premises true. Now R is easy to make true. It stands alone, it's a simple claim. There's nothing in the conclusion that would constrain us to force it to be true or false. 
So we can stipulate that R is true. And then, of course, if R is true in that premise, it's also true anywhere else we find it on that row, in this case also in the first premise. And that makes the right conjunct of that first premise true. We know that S is true. We now know that R is true, or that we're stipulating that R is true. That makes if R, then S true. And nothing prevents us from making both T and W true. So the right conjunct is also true. This means that the whole first premise is true. Since we have two conjuncts that are true, the left conjunct and the right conjunct, the conjunction, which is premise one, is also true. Now we can see that all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. We've constructed a row in which we've stipulated that the conclusion is false, and we were able to force all of the premises to be true without any inconsistency or contradiction. That means there was at least one possible row in that full, long truth table, complete truth table, in which all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. We've abbreviated that with this shorter method, and we've proven that, in fact, this argument is invalid. Now, if there's any argument where you can't do that, where once you've stipulated that the conclusion is false and you can't make all of the premises true, that argument is not invalid. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments or if I've made a mistake anywhere and need to correct it, please email me at jamie.c.watson at gmail.com.